Welcome to The Cap, where we are here to speak with college reps and other professionals in the field of college admissions to help answer all your questions and guide you through every step of the process. So if you're serious about college admissions, you've come to the right place. Are you ready? Let's talk about it. And now, here's your host, Dr. John Durante. Welcome to The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I am here to introduce you to college admissions representatives and other professionals in the field of college admissions. Our purpose is to serve you, the students and parents, so that you may gain insight straight from the people who ultimately make the decisions. Regardless of whether you apply to a particular school being highlighted in a given episode, you should listen to all of them, as each guest will give you tremendous insight and advice on every aspect of the college admissions process, prompting you to come up with your own follow-up questions for when you visit campus or meet with a college admissions representative yourself. Don't forget to visit our website, www.collegeadmissionstalk.com, or the show notes of each episode to access the alphabetical list of all the colleges available with the related audio link to the right of each school. The alphabetical list provides you with on-demand access to all of the episodes so that you may listen whenever you wish. And if you want to receive links to episodes before they are released on the podcast, along with other related resources, please fill out the email opt-in form also available on our website and in the show notes of each episode. Lastly, please email me with any questions or comments at collegeadmissionstalk at gmail.com. So are you ready? Let's talk about it. Welcome to the CAP, the College Admissions Process Podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today Jason McGrath, who's the Associate Provost and Director of Undergraduate Admissions at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, obviously also known as UNC. Jason, I am so happy to finally have you on. How are you today? John, I'm doing great. This is a fun time of year. It's a busy time of year, but uh, <laughs> but this is well worth the time to kind of step out and have this conversation and help as much as I can. Well, I am so grateful and honored that you're here. So let's get right to it, Jason. Can you give us an overview of what makes UNC Chapel Hill so unique? And what are some of the things you offer inside of your classrooms and beyond that set it apart from other universities? So when I think about what makes Carolina unique, it's it starts with sort of who we are as an institution. You know, we'll, you, you'll hear us talk a lot about being proud to be the first public institution in the United States. Um, So our mission talks about things about being a center for research and scholarship and creativity and teaching a diverse community of future leaders. And we really make sure that's integrated into organizations on campus, academic opportunities on campus. So I say that because I think there are certainly institutions out there who have wonderful mission statements, but they get put up on a shelf. And they may not necessarily use it as a guiding principle in how they do their business. And for us, our mission statement is part of who we are. So we make sure that whether it's a new academic program that we believe is going to benefit the economy of North Carolina, we believe that creating this opportunity is going to certainly draw in students from out of state, but we know the end result is it's going to make our state stronger educationally, financially, and so on, and sustain itself longer Uh, and serve more students and more people in our community. So academically, what I really love about a place like Carolina, and I'll mention this again, depending on what we talk about, is every student starts in the College of Arts and Sciences. So we have students who come here, they're they're pre-med interests, they're business interests, they have public health interests, nursing, but everyone starts in the College of Arts and Sciences. And I think that's really important because so many strong high school students have great backgrounds, great experiences, but they haven't had a chance to sample everything yet. And our core curriculum called Ideas in Action really creates an opportunity for students to learn about communication skills, learn about um, understanding how to utilize data uh, accurately. We have uh, triple I courses that allow multiple faculty to teach, kind of co-teach the same class so students get opportunity to learn from multiple faculty members. Um, So I think this kind of collaborative nature of the academics where everyone starts in arts and sciences and then transitions if they want to into professional programs is, is academically one of the things that is different at Carolina. And I think, again, when I come back to it, the, the broad range of students that we're serving because we are here to serve our state in the long run also adds and changes the classroom experience for everybody. Whether you're coming from New York, or you're coming from California or coming from overseas, 
you're going to be in classrooms of students who are the first in their families to go to college. You're going to be in classes of students who are fourth fourth generation Tar Heels that are excited <laughs> to be here. And I think all of that creates a learning environment that leads to better outcomes for the students as well. Well, I love that overview. First of all, you mentioned that you're the first public institution in the United States, which is terrific. And I love how you explained how you have so many students coming from so many different backgrounds, but everyone starts in the College of Arts and Science. You talked about that core curriculum under the Ideas in Action program. So that's terrific. Thank you so much. And by the way, your students are so happy, Jason, on campus. <laughs> I read your retention rate is an astonishing 97%, which is one of the highest in the entire country. The national average is at about 70%. So Jason, what's the secret in keeping <laughs> so many students happy at UNC and wanting to come back year after year? Well, you know, I'd like to take all the credit for it. I'll say this, <laughs> in admissions offices, I think Carolina in particular, we we will take a little bit of credit in the sense that we like to believe that we are really transparent with students about what Carolina can offer them, what the experience will be when they get here. So I think I, I really mean that admissions offices, our job isn't to just get applications. It's not just to get students here. It's to find the right students who want to be here, who want to make the most out of the opportunities that we have available here. So when I say admissions has a role in this, it's because we have to talk about what we offer in the right ways so that families understand they can that they can see themselves here so the students see opportunity here so we play some small part in this um, obviously when we make those admissions decisions we have a process there as well to select the students that we think will be great here but when you really think about it we have partnerships that extend across campus um, student affairs housing all these colleagues that have shared with us also what they have seen um, a successful student look like, what, it, what challenges students are faced with. So we allow ourselves in the admissions space to think about who's going to be best prepared to overcome that uh, first semester in college you know, uh, adjustment period. Who's going to be the student that's going to hit the ground running and being ready to serve those students? And I think the service to students is a big piece of this. Our colleagues across campus are prepared to obviously work with students who come right in and, and they're ready to do research, right? They, they, these are students that are really highly qualified and they're ready. They come from really rigorous backgrounds. But we also have students coming in who have performed really well in high school. But what they find is college is very different than what high school was for them. And we have support services in place to hit them where they are and help them hit the ground running, but also at a different pace, perhaps at first and then support them as they succeed, support them as they struggle as well. I think obviously the lead, this leads to a kind of culture uh, that is more collaborative than competitive. And I think that fosters retention as well. Again, I think there's a lot of great schools out there, a lot of dynamic competitive students to, to consider those schools. But we're trying to draw in students that are motivated internally for their own sort of ambitious goals that they have for themselves. <laughs> but they don't want to achieve it at the expense of their classmates. They're not trying to knock people down in order to rise up themselves. They're right. trying to support each other. And they've worked, and I'll hear our students talk about this. They've seen that they go further when they support other people and when they learn together. Um, the last piece I'll mention is that one of the pieces that's, I hate to use words like unique in admissions because <laughs> it doesn't take too long to realize it's just called something else at another school. <laughs> but I think we are, we are fortunate that we house half of our undergraduate students on our campus. And to be a public wow. flagship and to be able to house roughly 10,000 of your 20,000 undergraduates, that, that creates community. That's community where you're learning from each other, half of that learning outside the classroom as much as it, in, as it is in the classroom. And I think that combination with the academics, with the collaborative environment, leads to a community that really wants to be a part of something special. And whether that's celebrating big victories academic, uh, athletically uh, <laughs> or, or whether it's celebrating someone's achievement in the classroom, it just creates that community we talk so much about at Carolina. Well, that's so important. I love how you talked about the fact that you have about 10,000 students that live on your campus all the time, which again, fosters and builds that community, which adds to that 97% <laughs> retention rate. And I like how you talked about that. You're more collaborative as a school as opposed to competitive, which I think is great. You also talked about wanting students that see themselves at UNC. So as the director of admissions, can you shed light, right? Unpackage that a little bit more. What are the characteristics or qualities that you and your team at UNC value most in its applicants? 
experience? Well, again, I'll start by saying I have a, I'm very fortunate to do the work I do because hmm. to be at a place like Carolina where so many dynamic and interesting students want to be, um, it's, a, it's a privilege to be able to read their applications and hear their stories. It's hard to say no to so many of them. So as we're kind of going through what we look for and we read applications looking for reasons to admit students, right? We're not right. looking for flaws. Everyone's human. They're going to be flaws. Um, but we're trying to find students who embrace academic challenge. So not just being a high achiever, but someone who's motivated by academic challenge, um, someone who um, finds that it's it's fun to engage in the learning process, not just trying to check a box. I took this hard class. I got this grade. <laughs> let me move on. But that they're in, they're interested in kind of pushing themselves a little bit deeper into the material. Um, so again, when we read an application, we're really focused a lot on the context a student's coming from, their school context, community context, um, high school and family context, and what have they done to help us see that they embrace challenge. Uh, we also really have a broad range, as I mentioned, of students here. So we value finding students who are, maybe it's just too cliche a term, but bridge builders, um, <laughs> people that are really good at navigating going from this community of students to that community of students and building linkages that help that, that community kind of tie itself together. Even though we're all interested in our own unique and different things, there's common bonds that can be formed. And finding students that are good at that at the high school level can mean that they could be really beneficial to our community when they get here as well. Um, we value creative students. Uh, whether that's through musical opportunities, drama, theater, uh, but even those that are creative, and I, this gets back to that challenge, if they're creative in how they approach traditional core academic disciplines, people that can have fun with math uh, and studying, <laughs> and, and you read this in, rec in recommendations and in, in essays and students that love math in ways or they love English in ways that are just different than someone who can achieve a good grade in that course, that's great. But where people love to play with the material, um, that stands out in an application as well. Um, and the other thing I'll add is that our business programs here speak a lot about entrepreneurship. So there's opportunities for students who are go-getters and really risk takers and kind of creating new paths for learning for themselves, new opportunities for others. Um, we also, again, I talk a lot about community. We, we, want, we want good people. Um, it sounds it sounds so simple, um, whether that's character and you think of it that way, whether it's kindness and you think of it that way. Um, we don't want to create a community where it's just people that are, you know, high achievers and in living in their lane and not engaging mm. with others. We want that, that, that kind of student that teachers write about loving in their classroom because that's the student they'll lean on to go support other students that might be struggling. That's the student that's going to on their own reach out and support that classmate that might be struggling. So, um, you know, at Carolina, we're, we have these community of learners and scholars that we want to thrive. We, we don't want them to just achieve. We want them to really make the most. And, and you need good people to do that. Well, that's terrific. It's definitely a special place. And I like how you talk about the fact that you're looking for reasons to admit students. After all, you're admissions counselors and not rejection counselors. That's right. And you're looking for students who are interested in really pushing themselves. And of course, you determine that based on what it is that they did in their high schools, whether it's looking at the transcript to get an idea of the rigor what was offered to them, what they took advantage of, and also what they did outside of the classroom that's going to help you determine whether or not, as you put it, you know, they're good people. That's what you want, right? You said we want good people. So something really important for students and parents to just keep in mind. Now, Jason, I know that UNC places importance on a holistic approach to its application review process. Can you explain what this means for applicants to UNC? And are there any steps potential students should consider to present a well-rounded and thorough application? So it's a, it's a great question. And I, it's one we get asked a lot because I think students are always trying to think about how to kind of present themselves the best, you know, honestly, but still their best. And this is my second year at Carolina. And I came from a very selective um, private institution that only admitted, you know, fewer than 10% of all of its applicants. Mm. And I only mentioned that because when I got to Carolina and I began to learn how we do our evaluation process in the reading, uh, both for transfer as well as for first year students. Uh, I was blown away by the level of thorough and individual approaches that we took to learn who students were. Again, I mentioned context earlier, 
you know, we want to see what they're doing wherever they are. Um, I, I had a former director, and I'll, I'll, I'll name him John Gaines. Um, mm. I learned a lot from John Gaines, and I'll quote him a couple times probably today just because <laughs> he comes to mind a lot. But, you know, it applies here at Carolina. We, we talk about students being well-rounded. I always want to make sure students understand that we are looking to create a well-rounded community of students, a well-rounded community of scholars. But that doesn't mean every student needs to be everything to all people. And I think it's, there's room for well-angled students in a well-rounded class, which is what John would always say. Hmm. And I really latched onto that because I think it allows students to breathe a little bit and when they hear that, I hope. So they realize, oh, okay, because my angle is research and STEM and science hmm. and that's my thing. I, I do some community service, but not a lot, and I don't play sports. Well, I still have a chance. And yes, you'll still have a chance. You can stand out through your angle, whatever it might be. And there's room for a lot of different types of students in that process. So I think that that's very true at Carolina. Uh, we don't expect them to be all things to all people. Um, I usually tell people that in general, you know, to present themselves, academics, of course, come first, right? We to get to the table where you have the strongest opportunity of actually being offered admission, you need to have your academics in, in that competitive space that, that we expect. So most students that we're looking at that are in that space are at or near the top part of their, their graduating class, whatever that might look like at their school. And I say top part because I don't want to get held on to a, a rank or a percentage, but, <laughs> but, but students generally know if they're near the top part of their class. And so that's why I talk about it that way. And ideally they're doing that taking a curriculum that their high school would define as among the most rigorous available to them. And at some high schools, that could be dual enrollment. At other high schools, it could be a wealth of AP opportunities. Um, but the point is for us as, as application reviewers, we're looking at what they could do and then what did they do and then how well did they do it. Um, and again, all of that's relative to their particular school community. And that academic piece um, is part of that. You know, we, we use the common application at, at Carolina. Right. It's, it's the one application platform. So as students are thinking about how to prepare and present themselves, I think it's important they, that they know that admissions reviewers are trying to picture a student. They're trying to get a, 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 a story, if you will, put together so they really understand the student from start to finish. Um, so whether it's the, the combination of how they use the biodemographic information, um, family background, they can indicate honors and activities and awards that they've received, their extracurriculars, their essays, what people write about them, all these things. It's great for admissions people when it all makes sense mm -hmm. that the person that the English teacher is writing about is the best creative writer they've ever had <laughs> also wrote a great creative writing piece in their essay. And I'm like, oh, this is what they're talking about. I right. totally get it. Um, so I think there's things like that that students can keep in mind is that if the, the story of who they are makes sense start to finish as they put their application together, it's a big ask. And we in the admissions world need to understand that as well. It's not natural for students to, to do this. And so I think it's important that we have some grace involved. And I don't expect a polished application from every student. Hmm. It's more that I want students to hear, use every space that they want to use that's part of the application. And if they aren't sure if their story is being told, typically there's a space for additional information. They can put some information in there that explains that one bad grade in sophomore year. Right. They could explain they transferred high schools and why. Um, there's a space for their story to be told in there. Um, and I think that's that's really an important piece. And again, if you'll, if you'll indulge me, I'll give one example of a story Please. from an application years ago. And I always use this example because it can't be replicated because it's paper-based. It's hmm. I've been doing this long enough to have paper <laughs> applications. And there was a student that wrote their essay about how they would doodle in class and it's how they focused. It's how they locked in and paid attention to what the teacher was telling them. And their teachers always thought they weren't paying attention. So the teacher would always call on them while they were doodling and they got the answer right <laughs> every time. Drove the teacher nuts. Uh, but as they're writing this essay, what is surrounding their essay is their artwork. Mm. They, they doodled <laughs> all around the essay they submitted. That's clever. <laughs> and it was so well done and it fit the narrative of the kind of student I read about from the counselor letter, from teachers. And again, to this day, I don't even remember if they were offered admission. It's not important. <laughs> <laughs> right. What's important is they presented themselves authentically. They, they weren't afraid to kind of go out and do that for themselves. And I don't know that 
anyone would have recommended that these days, um, but it really fit their story and it helped us get to know them better. I want to welcome back Sean Patel, who's the CEO and founder of Prep Expert. Sean, thank you so much for being here. How are you? Doing well. Thanks for having me, John. Just wanted to do a quick shout out for an amazing deal that we have for college admissions process podcast listeners. We're offering 30% off all Prep Expert SAT and ACT courses in tutoring. It's live online. We've got the best score improvement guarantees in the industry. You'll get taught by 99th percentile instructors. And you can save 30% off when you go to the show notes of the College Admissions Process Podcast. Grab your discount code for 30% off and click the link in the show notes. Thank you, Sean. So great to have you again. And to everyone out there, please note that if you make a purchase through any of our affiliate links, the podcast gets a commission. But rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. Thank you all and best wishes. Well, we really appreciate that. Students, parents, here we have the Director of Admissions at UNC, one of the greatest universities in the entire world. And he's talking about how you really have to be mindful of telling your story. Be mindful of all of the different parts of the application. Understand that obviously the transcript, that's your academics, your activity sheet, what you did outside of the classroom, your essay, that's your voice, uh, a recommendation letter, that's someone else's voice about you. And be mindful that each part has to build upon the last. And again, tell your story. You gave a great example of a doodler. And they were not shy when we could use paper in the application process <laughs> that's right. of actually doodling so that they can tell their own story. So I, I think that's just tremendous insight. I really appreciate that, Jason. And of course, the overall number of applications schools are receiving are clearly on the rise in uh, recent years. So with an increase in applications, how do you determine how many students to accept, waitlist, or even deny when you don't necessarily know how many of those accepted applicants are actually going to attend. So it's one of these things where I think a lot of us in admissions will quickly say it's, you know, we're not, we're not doctors, we're not performing heart, <laughs> open heart surgery, we're not rocket scientists, right? But there is a lot of strategy, a lot of data analytics, and a lot of modeling that goes into making sure mm. we get this as right as we can. Um, and that's, there's a lot of credit to be given. You know, I'm fortunate in Carolina we have a well-built out and supportive team here in the enrollment division. Um, so that includes people involved in systems work that build models and tools for us to use to do this work, as well as our data and analytics team to help us in analyzing what, you know, certain parts of what we can look at, we can understand. And there's certain parts that are deeper levels of, of analytics that we need to get into that we need support with. So there's a great team that does this. And we use our historical information uh, to make a lot of initial kind of to boil it down to basics, we use historical information to do this. And we, we, we know how many offers we make. We know how many traditionally people are accepting. So that, that yield of offers made to those that accept your offer. And we break that down by different populations. And, you know, now in the post Supreme Court era, lawsuit era, you know, we're making sure we're really only looking at things like um, North Carolina residents, what do those numbers look like historically with offers and yield on those offers? What do out-of-state residents look like? What do global or international students look like? So that when I say breaking down to populations, that's what I'm talking about. It's really those three broad categories. We also have other categories, though, when we think about um, students who defer admission from one year to the next. Those students sometimes come back into, into the fold. Sometimes they don't. So we have to model how many of those are likely to kind of come back to us the next year as well as we're building our class model. Um, we have an early action process and a regular mm -hmm. decision process. So all of these subcategories I've talked about, we break down by early, early action as well as regular decision. Um, the other thing that we've introduced this year, um, we've always been a school that as needed would utilize our wait list to wrap up our class. And what we've introduced this year is the plan to use the wait list. Um, in other words, it's part of our really enrollment model. And, and I'll credit Doug Christiansen and others I've worked with in places I've been. It's a really valuable way from an enrollment standpoint. I know it's hard for students, right? It's hard to be waitlisted and have to wait for an answer. But as an institution, and I haven't st stated this yet here, at Carolina, we have an obligation as a state 
uh, institution that 82% of our incoming first year students are North Carolina residents and only 18% can be non-residents. And so as such, using the wait list allows us to make sure that we're making that number happen and that we're not gonna exceed one way or the other. Because there's actually institutionally, there's financial penalties if you exceed those, don't hit hmm. those numbers more than one year in a row. Um, there's a whole bunch, I won't go into all that, but there's penalties with it. So it's important that we get that 82, 18 as right as we can. And that now utilizing the wait list is yet another modeling tool we have to think about is, okay, how many are we gonna think we wanna bring in from the wait list? How many of those students t tend to accept our offer to be on the wait list? How many of them are going to be there in March or May or whenever we go to the wait list? So we have to think about a lot of those different factors. So with the big volume of applications, when you boil it down to offers made and who's going to accept the offers, there is a lot that goes into it. There's a team of people that analyze it so that we can all poke at it a little bit and say, well, don't forget this. Don't forget that. It's, it's a great team effort here to get that number as right as we can. Well, that's tremendous insight. So let's package this all just a little bit. Before we mm -hmm. talk about the 18% of out-of-staters, I was just curious, do you know your actual yield percentage year to year? And how different is it for in-state and your out-of-state students? It doesn't vary that much. In fact, uh, the in-state is traditionally yielding at like 58 to 59% almost every year. I mean, it, it's a half percent fluctuation a little bit here and there. Um, and then out of state, traditionally, it's going to yield low, mid 20% range. Um, and what I tell people is that that's, that's a pretty typical yield. Mm -hmm. um, if, uh, if you look at the most selective schools and their regular decision process yield, that's pretty typical because these are wonderful students who have just wonderful opportunities and they're going to make up their minds about where they're going to go, um, but they have a lot of good choices. Um, and so I think it's not surprising to see how well we yield in-state um, there's a lot of students mm -hmm. that have dreamed for generations of coming <laughs> here, and, and that's and it's wonderful. We're also remarkably affordable relative to the cost of college these days um, for in-state students. Um, our in-state tuition is about nine thousand wow. um, dollars. So it's pretty remarkable opportunity for an in-state student. That really is, and um, so we're very fortunate that way as well. Well, we appreciate that. And, you know, earlier you touched upon institutional priorities and the big one for UNC is the fact that you cannot accept more than 18% out of state students. Now I'm going to repeat that again. Students at UNC, they cannot accept more than 18% of their student population from outside of the great state of North Carolina. And I mentioned that, Jason, because a lot of times a student will apply and they get rejected. And all of a sudden it becomes, what did I do? Was it my essay? Was it, you know, not too many activities, not enough leadership? No, sometimes it's all about the institutional priorities. So however many seats that you're trying to fill for your freshman class, I'm sure you get thousands upon thousands more of whatever it is that number is. And so, you know, you have so many qualified students and you have to look at those institutional priorities. So, you know, it's wonderful that 82% of your class is from North Carolina. Let me ask you a follow-up question about the 18% from out of state. So if I'm an out of state student, what are some of the things that I can do to really make my application to UNC stand out? It's, it's a great question. And again, that I'll always clarify the 18% out of state is the enrolling first year class number, mm -hmm. right? It's a little, little different, a little more flexible transfer. Um, right. but, but the percent that we enroll for first year students out of state has to be no greater than 18%. And um, that includes our international and global students as well. And this is, I think, where it gets to be um, even harder for families to understand, as you pointed out, when wonderful students don't get offered admission. Um, they don't realize that we might have typically five, six percent of our entering class are global students right. who are citizens of other countries. That leaves 13%, hmm. give or take 12% of the entering class that are domestic non-residents. So it's really, it's really competitive. And I, and I tell people that, you know, this year we had about a little over 67,000 applications this year, Wow, <laughs> uh, which was uh, about a 15% increase over last year. We weren't planning for that. Um, and that percentage saw an increase in both in-state and out-of-state. And I think the number that surprises people is that of that 67,000, about 51,000 are non-residents. Wow. <laughs> so to your question, what it takes to stand out, I think it's really comes, it's emphasizing what we talked about before. 
It's that that story. And I think it's also emphasizing that there's a lot of students who are really engaged and, and do a lot of things. And I think what we are very fortunate at a place like Carolina, because the number of students who want to be here who are incredibly gifted and talented, uh, we really want to find those difference makers in communities. We want to find people that leave spaces better than when they found them. We want mm-hmm. to find students who take classroom spaces and they elevate the classroom because they're in it. So they're not just getting A's in the AP classes. And I don't mean to dismiss that. That's hard to do. Uh, We all, we talk about the number of AP students are taking, and if they're really college level (laughs) courses, you know, taking five of those in a year, oh my gosh, what are we expecting these students to do? (laughs) But it's one thing to get A's in those classes. It's another thing to be that student who the teacher would write about and say that they make them a better teacher. They, they have to think about that student when they plan their lesson hmm. because the kinds of questions they're going to ask. <laughs> and, and, I, and I say this, I don't, ex, I don't expect every student to be that student. And that's, that's atypical, right? That's why, it, hmm. that's why there's so few of them out there for us to offer admission to because that's really a rare student to find in a pool. So again, not every student is that student. But when you ask what does it take to stand out, academically, those are some of the things that stand out. It's not to dismiss taking a strong, rigorous curriculum and being in that straight A, I'm number one or I'm top 10% in my class, whatever it is. But because we have 51,000 students Mm. who are out of state and most of them are at the top of their class and most of them are leading or are in charge of some organization or group, we have to keep digging deeper in terms of what we learn about them in the application and continuing to look for ways to advocate for them. And when we find those pieces of community members that make communities better, people that have brought new initiatives to a commute campus, whether that could be, you know, they, they help the school system get a different dress code, you know, or, <laughs> or, or whether they've brought, you know, um, maybe they've been involved in initiatives to bring drinking water and improving drinking water right. in communities around the world. Right. We can all find those students in our, in our brain that we know of that we've worked with at some point that were really difference makers. Um, and I say that really cautiously because I know that has the runs the risk of discouraging students mm-hmm. or making students feel like the bar is set at an unfair level. Um, but I also want to remind students that this is all within context. I don't expect a student to do research with NIH if they don't live <laughs> near NIH, right? I had I grew up in the DC area. I, right. I, I recruited the DC area for a long time and seeing students do research at NIH, NIST, all these places. That's wonderful, but I don't expect a student living in a rural part of the U.S. Hmm. or a remote part of the world to have that same opportunity. So what that student needs to do is to help us understand, and what their letters of recommendation can do is help us understand what are they doing to maximize their opportunities? What are they bringing to their space that perhaps wasn't there before? Maybe they're the first time they've ever had um, back-to-back dorm prefects you know, at this boarding school in a remote part of the world, and they've never had someone do it two years in a row. And they can talk about that for us and help us understand that context. Maybe they are um, the first in their family to go to college, and they've also sought opportunities at the local community college. Hmm. And maybe they're actually not just doing things there, but maybe the teachers that, they're, that they have at that community college didn't even know they were a high school student because hmm. the way they bring class discussions to that next level. So it's hard to think of all the examples at one time, but I want to make sure students hear that while the bar can sound really high, it's a reminder that we're still looking at them within the context of what's available to them. And then what have they done to really push that envelope uh, within their community, within what's available to them? Well, I love that. You talk about wanting students who are difference makers, students tell your story, whatever it is. How did you contribute? How did you leave wherever you were prior to coming to college? How did you leave it and and make it better? And again, your unique story. You're not trying to be someone else. It's whatever it is that you offer, whatever you contribute, that's what they want to hear about. And for students interested in specific programs or schools within UNC Chapel Hill, how does the application review process differ, if at all? For example, are there portfolios or perhaps interviews required for any of your schools or a student's intended major? That's a great question because this does vary a lot from college to college and university mm. to university. And I, it, it's, a, it's a maze for students to navigate. <laughs> um, we actually don't conduct any interviews for mm-hmm. our admissions process. Um, and largely because 
we can't interview everybody. And so from, a, from an equity standpoint, <laughs> is there a problem? 67,000 applicants? Is, what's the problem, Jason? <laughs> We've got an amazing alumni base, but I don't think we can get to everybody. Um, and I think the other thing about it is that, you know, for us, everyone is applying and they can indicate three different academic interest areas. They can indicate an interest in a program or a school, but by and large, we're still admitting them to the College of Arts and Sciences like we talked about before. Right, right. There, there are assured admission programs. We call them in, in our paperwork and on the application, a student might see what we call a sort of a special opportunity. Mm -hmm. And we have assured admission to our Keenan Flagler Business School. We have assured admission for um, some of our public health programs. Um, and what those are are very small number of students that are really clearly a great fit for that school and that program. And so we might make that, that opportunity available to that student where they know that when the time comes as a Carolina student where you need to apply to that professional school, they are guaranteed that admission will happen along as, so long as they meet some basic GPA credit requirements. But I also wanna make sure that when students see assured admission, they don't get upset if they don't get it. That's my, that's the, that's the tug and that's the push and pull. So we have assured admission programs, but most of our students get to the professional schools after they're here. They don't, most don't get it through assured right. admission, a very small number will. So that's the only difference to the process. There's no separate portfolio. We do have um, a process for uh, drama, uh, some process for music, some process that way for some specialty programs um, that way. But by and large, no, most students are not doing anything different based on an academic program or area. Um, of course, we partner with programs like Robertson for their scholarship programs, Moorhead Kane. Those are separate but related entities. So they may have an interview process, they may have some separate application process, but that's not the application to Carolina specifically. Understood. And again, over 67,000 applications. So obviously you're receiving applications from thousands of high schools throughout the country and frankly beyond. When reviewing applications, Jason, from so many different high schools, how do you take into account when one offers its students all of the AP or IB courses imaginable, while another high school may only offer a small fraction of those offerings? So how does the application review process differ for students from these very different types of high schools? It's a wonderful question. I think it's one of the things that we try to, when people wonder what do admissions people do, right? Or <laughs> what, what qualifies someone to do it? I think it does, it takes time to get comfort and experience seeing the wide array of curriculum opportunities students have, grading scales they come from. Hmm. Um, all these things are different. It's schools that don't do grades, schools that don't indicate any level of rigor in their courses because they view them all to be the most rigorous courses, <laughs> right? And, and all of those things are okay. So I think the message we wanted students to hear is that, don't worry so much about are you advantaged or disadvantaged because your school offers AP, doesn't offer AP, offers IB, maybe it doesn't offer anything, it's maybe less resourced. So it's pursuing dual enrollment through the community college is the way you seek out rigor. The thing that we want people to hear from us is that we train our teams uh, of readers really in a thorough way, weeks of training, going through hundreds of sample files, really making sure we understand whether that's what do applications look like coming from China and India, Korea, Brazil, you name it. We try to train all of that before the season ever hits. So when we get to those applications and see that curriculum that might be um, atypical in a domestic environment, but is not atypical around the world, our team is ready for that. So we train up a lot and do a lot of that training uh, in-house for weeks in the fall as well as in the summer. And anyone who's new to our office, I always like to say this too, if it's their first time reading for Carolina, they're going to go through a lot of training, but they're also going to have people reading behind every single decision mm. that that person is, is making before we actually view it as a final decision or even, even, a, even a recommended decision um, because they're still calibrating and that's natural, that's human. And so we build that into our review process as well. But yes, we, we are comfortable whether it's a national curriculum for a student coming from abroad, whether it's a Cambridge program, um, IB, AP, it's all about context. What would that high school tell us the most demanding curriculum looks like? And is that student taking it? And most demanding might look a couple different ways 
most demanding doesn't mean you take all the APs offered. Um, <laughs> most demanding is also, well, the context might be my school limits. My school doesn't right. let me take more right. than five AP classes. I'm allowed two as a junior, no more than three as a senior. But my friend goes to the public school down the street and they have 12. Hmm. And that people worry that that student with 12 is going to be advantaged. It's not, we don't look at applications that way. We look at them within the context of their school and their community. What could they do? I said, yeah, I said this before, what could they do? What did they do? And how well did they do it? And academically, that's what that gets down to. So um, I, I, we get the question. I, I probably get it as much both ways. I think there are students that attend very rigorous, whether those be private or even charter schools, and they feel like they have a harder time than the student that goes to what is perceived as a, an easier school. Hmm. And the reality is what I typically explain to students is that we're very aware of typically the outcomes of those schools, whether those be the publicly available data that we can learn about a high school. A high school may share data or information in a school profile that they include right. with the transcript. And that allows us to learn more about the school. And what I tell people is that whether a school is viewed as really rigorous or it has a reputation of not being as rigorous, what it's most likely going to tell us is how deep we feel we can go into that school, that graduating class, and find students that we feel are ready for Carolina's rigor. Hmm. It's not that you have a harder or easier chance. It's how deep we think we can go. So imagine the really rigorous high school, whether, whatever that means to the person listening to this. Hmm. Everyone has their own perception of that. <laughs> if it's more rigorous than the school down the street, we probably can go deeper into that class. If it's a school that isn't as rigorous, we probably know that. And we probably have an expectation that this is probably as far as we can go and really find those students who are going to be able to hit the ground running at Carolina. Well, I appreciate you emphasizing the point that, first of all, you really are thoughtful and mindful in terms of knowing the different high schools, what they offer. You talk about it before the review process. You have the school profiles. And it's great to hear you saying that you're evaluating an applicant based on the context of their high school. So students, whether you're limited in terms of how many advanced courses you can take or in terms of how many are even offered at your school, you are reviewed based on the context of what your school offers. And they look to see whether or not you took advantage, again, based on what was there. So we appreciate that. And of course, I know that UNC is also test optional, like many schools throughout the country. Can you share the percentage of students that actually applied and who were also admitted that did not submit their test scores? So uh, as an admissions guy, I'll, I'll talk more than I should to answer this question, right? <laughs> uh, but, I, but I think one of the things I'll start with is that remember that UNC, Chapel Hill, we're part of a 16-school UNC system. Mm -hmm. The decision to go test optional was made at the system level. And when the system made the decision several years ago to go test optional, it was due to access and availability to take the test. So there was a waiver put in place that expires essentially with this graduating senior class. Mm -hmm. We are awaiting word from our system office about whether that's going to be that waiver will be extended beyond this cycle. And when Jason gets a chance to just weigh in, <laughs> I, I'm a believer that test, test optional is a healthy th place to be. I mm -hmm. think it allows students who perform well on the test to submit it. It allows those that don't think it represents them as well as their other parts of their application to not submit it. So I think that's, that's a win-win. Um, I know that there's also a lot of questions about performance in college for students. And people are wondering if I didn't have a test score and I got admitted, did those students perform as well as other students who had a test score? Hmm. And I think a lot of schools, the reason I would like to see the, the test optional extended in Carolina, like other schools have done in, in other locations, is I think it allows more distance from the impact of COVID on the preparation for college. So many of the students who are maybe test optional we're also students, and I just was reading an application today where ninth grade was really brutal for them. Hmm. It was really difficult either returning to a classroom or, or still being in a remote setting or being in a remote setting with siblings running around while you're trying to learn math. Right. So right. I think the COVID impact on the educational preparation for students entering college now is, is overlapped with test optional happening. And I, and I would like us to make sure we have enough distance from those two. And so they're really, truly distinct issues. And we can assess that then. So until the system announces, I don't, I can't even tell you today whether we're going to be test optional for students applying for next year. At Carolina, to get to your actual raw data, we typically see high 60s, maybe even 70% of our admit offers 
going to students who have test scores. And I think I, I always want to make sure, I, I want families to believe that we are what we say we are when we say we're test optional. We absolutely, and again, I, I really have been impressed by this in the, in the year and a half I've been at Carolina. I don't get asked by other senior administrators, what's our testing profile? I don't get asked, are we trying to raise the profile? And I say that mm. because that's a luxury. Um, not every institution operates that way. Some schools care more about it than others. So the numbers may be what the numbers are, but it's not because someone's saying to us, hey, make sure we grab all the high test scores. I think what happens in our pool is with 50 some odd thousand students applying from out of state, 16,000 in state, and a lot of those students having access to test prep and testing again, we're seeing those students submit those scores when they do well on them. Hmm. And I think that sometimes is going hand in hand for our pool of students who are also performing well in the classroom. So it's not that we're trying to favor the test score, but I want families to also hear this. Because we are aware of this percentage and we're aware of human nature. Um, most of us who are test optional today weren't before COVID. And we're all learning every year how to be the best version of our process as a test optional mm -hmm. school. So we are actually making sure in our review process, I think I threw out earlier how we go back through every high school school group to make sure we feel like the decisions we're about to make make sense. The other charge among them, there are a lot of different things we ask our readers to do in that process. And one of them is to spot check decisions around test optional. To say, why, if you see an outlier, do you see the rare student that's not being admitted among a sea of other admitted students? Are they the one without a test score? And if so, open that file back up again and make sure that we aren't disadvantaging that student unintentionally. If you see the rare student with the test score and they're the only one being admitted, hmm. make sure we're not favoring that student. And I will say that by and large, when I look back through our school groups, um, I'm pleasantly surprised and pleasantly, I'm just pleased with most of what I see is a range. I'll see students admitted who don't have scores that are sitting in parts of the class that make sense. I'll see students who are in parts of the class with the test score denied that make sense and they have strong testing. So. I don't say that to say it's beneficial one way or the other, but just to remind people that, yes, the numbers may tell a story that makes it sound like we are admitting a higher percentage who have a test score, but we are not doing so without lots of checks and balances to make sure that it, with the pool of applicants presented to us, that those aren't still the right students for us to be making offers of admission to. Um, and, and again, that's, that's a slippery slope and it's challenging. Um, but it's something we continue to kind of work on and improve. And, and again, I'll credit the Carolina process that existed before I got here. Every year we try to get better at our evaluation and review process. And this is just one more piece of that. Well, again, I appreciate you emphasizing the checks and balances, which I think is so important in this process. And I'm going to repeat again that you talked about the fact that decision moving forward will be at the system level. Of course, that's the UNC system level. So, you know, students and parents, it's very important to check the websites of the different universities to make sure that you're seeing the most up-to-date information in terms of schools being test optional or not. So I know it's at the system level, Jason, but I was curious, where do you see the test optional nature of the application review process going over the next few years? It's interesting because uh, that's a question that I probably would have answered in a different way a mm. year or two ago. Uh, and I've been surprised in both directions when I've seen different schools announce their plans to extend test optional or their plans to go back to testing. Uh, and I think it's been interesting to see schools that are the public might view as being very similar, potentially making very different decisions uh, on this topic. Uh, when they think about extending to the classes of 25, 6, and 7 is typically, or or extending permanently. And again, there are systems like California system and others that have made much stronger statements about what they believe. Um, but I think for me, what I've, what I've come to kind of understand, maybe as test optional fits the same way as everything else with admissions I've learned over the years. I don't judge other schools for their decisions when, when they come out with these, these, these plans that work for them. I've, I've really come to see that maybe it's from working at a couple different institutions that 
what works for one will not work for the other. Hmm. Um, and the public may not understand it because they, on the surface, they look like similar places, um, similar academic profiles, similar testing profiles. But going back to our mission, our mission is here to serve and find those wonderful students in our state so that we can kind of keep advancing our state and being the best version of ourselves. And I think test optional does a better job of allowing us to do that than requiring the test score does. And I think some of that comes from anecdotal experiences with students that you think about what it takes to get extended time to sit for the SAT or the ACT if you're a student who has a learning difference. And some students know they can ask for that. Some school counselors have time to support the students hmm. in going through that process to get that extended time. And other students don't even know it exists. Right. And if you, depending on the educational capital at home, depending on the resources of the high school, there's just a lot of layers to what leads to good testing outcomes that I believe in terms of uh, equity in the process. Yes, some students are going to be strong testers and they think that will support their application and they want to submit those. And I think Carolina can accept those. But I also think Carolina would benefit by accepting applications from students who don't submit a test score because their best way of helping us see the kind of student they're going to be in our classroom is not based on a sitting for an exam one time and maybe the student didn't know to, or to, couldn't afford to take it other times because they got the state administered exam and that's what they stopped with. Um, but other students knew to do more than that. So I, I think moving forward, I hope, and maybe it's less about what I see and more what I hope, I hope that the public will come to understand that the best decisions are school-based decisions. And again, I think institutions have to make decisions on this test optional space that makes sense for the populations that their mission says they are there to serve. But I'm not going to judge another school who has data that says going back to testing makes sense for them. Mm. I can disagree with that philosophically, but I don't work there. And I don't, I don't know their applicant pool. I don't know their currently enrolled student population. So I think it's going to be just as confusing for the next several years for families mm. that see things like Carolina. If, like if we change and go back to requiring testing, you know, that's going to throw people for a loop a little bit for a year because you've got people that haven't been planning for that. And you've got others who've been planning for that. And now what equity challenges do you have with a pool requiring testing and those who've been doing test prep and those who haven't? So it, it's a little slippery, but uh, I think it's going to remain a little confusing for families as schools make the best decision for their institution. Jason, this has been a phenomenal conversation. Before I get to the last question, I have to ask, is there a question that I didn't ask today or a topic that just didn't come up in the conversation that you'd like to talk about and leave our listeners with now? I think it's the only question I can think of, and I don't know if it's so much a question, is the statement I, I forgot to mention during the discussion on how students put their applications together. And that is to remember not to try to package yourself in a way that you think is what we want. Hmm. Um, as you're telling your story, that is what we want to hear. Uh, if you tell us or try to sound like what you think we're looking for or what you think a typical Carolina student is, and I would argue there really isn't a typical Carolina student, uh, other than passionate about Carolina Blue, um, the reality is if you start to package yourself in those ways, you'll probably start to sound like a lot of other applicants as opposed to being authentically yourself. And at least if you know you put your authentic self as an applicant forward, you would never have any regrets when the process is done. Because if we don't find in you what, what you hope we will, then, then, then you shouldn't come here anyway, right? <laughs> because you... You deserve to go somewhere that finds the values in what you offer and sees the good fit so you'll thrive and they'll benefit from you. And so I, I hate to say it's our loss, but I mean, it's one of those situations mm -hmm. where you're better off to put yourself you know, together authentically than to overpackage. Well, we appreciate that. And again, Jason, I am so grateful that you're here. Unfortunately, it does lead us to that last question, which is what are the top three pieces of advice that you would provide students and their parents getting ready for the college admissions process? So this was a tricky one to kind of think about. And uh, <laughs> I'll start with maybe too personal, but so I, I'm the parent of two boys. One is a college sophomore and one is a high school senior. Hmm. Uh, so I, we're, we're <laughs> waist, <time. laughs> waist, neck deep. I'm not sure what the right metaphor would be right now, but we're deep in it right now. And uh, what's been, <laughs> from a parent standpoint, what I would say is, I, I don't mean to brag on my students, but they were strong performers in high school but in different ways. And, mm -hmm. and so one who's in college now is pursuing engineering 
And he's the kind of student who you give him a task, he's going to knock it out. Hmm. He, he loves it. He'll move on from it. But then it's in the rearview mirror and he's moving forward. And, and so then I have my son who's a senior who is very much interested in politics, global affairs, the economy, and is much more of a, I guess, I guess he, do, he loves learning. Hmm. And, and I think they engage with material in different ways. And I say that because that means they're going to, they also both engage very differently with the college search process. And so as a parent, a rem- reminder is my advice, one size does not fit all. So <laughs> you, you might have one, one child, you have to really hold their hand until they're truly ready to take the wheel and drive the process, then, then you may have some that they're driving from ninth grade on and <laughs> you're trying to keep up, you know, you're like, can we stop talking about college for once? Um, and I mean that with all affection, I, I think it's, it's really a range to, to be prepared for. Um, another piece I would say is that uh, I think for every student, you know, they, they need to remember that the process is as much about them finding the fit as it is remembering the pool they place themselves into. In other words, the decisions that they that they get later on from the process, those outcomes have as much to do with the other people that they put themselves alongside as it had to do with what they pursued for four years in high school. Mm-hmm. And that's a hard realization in, in, a, in a highly selective process. And that's a lot of the emails I've been having with families back and forth right now to say that there isn't anything else someone should have done. My advice to students is to pursue the things they love pursuing at a high level in high school. So when we look back on high school, they don't regret those choices, no matter what the college outcomes are. And I know that's easy to say. I know students fall in love with schools and they want to go to a certain place. But if they approach it that perspective, get the most out of high school, the things you love, challenge yourself, grow, do those things. And then think about the schools you place yourself into, because there are great schools, amazing places that you could be a great fit for that may not be highly selective and may have great outcomes for their graduates. And there are also going to be schools like Carolina, they're really highly selective and also have great outcomes for their graduates. But you need to be ready and have a thick skin to enter into a process like that. Um, and I think, again, the process is, is the last thing I want to make sure people remember is that success in this process is not about the number of schools you get into. Success is really about finding that match. Um, I'm probably one of the rare people where um, this is maybe more than you want to know. So, so my dad, my dad's second career, he ventured into the world of independent counseling. And um, with all due respect, to independent counseling, I'll, I'll, I'll characterize it this way because I know people have different opinions. I will put them in the class of, of, of those that are really all about students finding a fit, hmm. good financial fit, good social fit, all of those things. And this is back in the early 1991. My brother's process was he was going through college process. My dad didn't like the guidebooks. So he collapsed the guidebooks into a searchable database and created his own searchable database for this. And I say this because this is what I was around as a ninth grader. you know. <laughs> and so I've seen this process for a long time. And I think it's important to remember that it's about fit. And it's not that you see the fit in the college. It's not even that the college sees the fit in you because we admit students who don't choose us. Hmm. And it makes us disappointed. It's about fit when they both come together. And I think when both can come together, that's the that's the comfort level. And I think sometimes students are looking for that aha moment that this is the school. Sometimes the school is the school where you feel most comfortable, prepared to take on the challenge. It's going to push you. It may not have the big fancy name. It may not have the the bumper sticker phenomenon or whatever <laughs> your thing is, you know, that the parents are going to talk about over dinner with their with the neighborhood. But it's about where that student's going to thrive and be the best version of themselves. And that's my hope is that students are looking for those schools and are only applying to those schools they would actually want to attend when the process is all done. Well, Jason, UNC is obviously so lucky to have you as were we on this podcast episode. I'm so happy as I know that this conversation is going to help so many students and their parents as they navigate through the college admissions process. You were truly awesome. And again, I want to thank you for really going deep and giving us such great insight in terms of UNC, the great programs that you offer, but also pulling the curtain back and giving us a little bit more insight in terms of your overall application review. I do hope to have you again, Jason. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. It was awesome. And one last thing to say to everyone out there, good luck and best wishes with the college search. Take care, everyone. Until next time.
Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Cap, the College Admissions Process Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please don't forget to tell a friend and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and wherever you listen to your podcast. I am your host, John Durante, and I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Cap. Hey, podcast friends, are you or someone you know in need of some custom college gear? Prep Sportswear carries a wide variety of college fan gear and apparel, including T-shirts, sweatshirts, hoodies, hats, and so much more. So whether you're getting ready to go to the game, hanging out on campus, organizing a college bed decorating party, or you're simply looking to build upon your college gear, Prep Sportswear has you covered. Check out our Prep Sportswear affiliate partnership link in the show notes for all the details. Please note that if you make a purchase through any of our affiliate links, the podcast gets a commission, but rest assured that we would only promote products that we believe in and feel would benefit our listeners. Thank you all and best wishes.